Well, first, I want to thank and welcome uh, Assistant Minority Leader Kristen Boggs from the 18th District. Uh, to another of our Calfee Now conversations. So really appreciate the time and, and you being here. Thanks for having me. And I, I think I'm allowed to say you're probably one of my favorite uh, legislators Aww. to interact with. So this is a real <laughs> treat for me to, to get to do this. Thank I appreciate you. that. Um, so I'm gonna, favorite lobbyist. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start off with the, that, you know, kind of general question of, why in the world are you doing this? How did you get into how did you get into politics? And are you sorry you signed up yet? <laughs> oh, I mean, I first of all, I think it's fair to say that when I was appointed in January of 2016 to this seat, um, life was very different. <laughs> and my expectations have drastically changed about um, what life in the legislature is and will continue to be um, since being appointed and then ultimately elected. Uh, but I got into politics because I was working at the Ohio Attorney General's office. I was an assistant attorney general for about 10 years and my office looked over the state house capitol and I just really found myself uh, doing a lot of complaining about <laughs> what the legislature was doing, uh, which in, in, in 2015 was pretty, uh, pretty moderate things, actually. <laughs> compared to know, if, if only we had stopped there. <laughs> Um, but, you know, there, at the time, there were these, like, really radical ideas, like defunding Planned Parenthood and allowing guns in our daycares and universities and, you know, just doing these really socially conservative things that I didn't feel as a, you know, as a, as, as a practicing attorney with $100,000 of student loan debt as someone that was trying to start a family and trying to like plant roots in Ohio, uh, didn't think were the things that were going to help me be successful in Ohio or help keep me or people like me in Ohio. And I just found myself constantly complaining at happy hours and dinners with friends, like, why are they doing this? What are they doing? Why is this going to make Ohio great? Or And the seat came open and my husband said, you've been complaining a lot. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you you've been complaining a talk. lot. Do you, do you think you maybe want to run for this seat? And I was like, that's insane. Absolutely not. I'm working, uh, you know, at the attorney general's office. How's that even look? And he's like, well, you know, maybe you should talk to someone about it. And I was like, no way, no way. And then fast forward to the next morning at breakfast, I was like, do you think I could win? And he was like, no, <laughs> no way. He's like, maybe start talking to people. Because you obviously think that have some very strong feelings about what the legislature's doing. And, you know, you've represented many of the state agencies at this point. So you understand uh, how government works. You know, maybe you should talk to someone about it. And so, lo and behold, I, I, my goal was, I'm like, I'm just going to talk about it until somebody tells me this is a bad idea and I should sit down. <laughs> and, and now you're here you are five years later right? and now I, here i am five years <laughs> later <laughs> so. well we're, we're we're glad you did it, that's for sure Thank um you. and you know i think you bring a very unique perspective to the state house because the state house is in your district right and it's part of the 18th so give a description of what the 18th house district is what's it in, in public, 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 public. it is it is the coolest district in the state I'm gonna lie. <laughs> um, I, so my, my district is really unique uh, in that I have the highest population of 20, 18 to 25 year olds. And I have over half of my population is under the age of 50. Wow. And so when you think about what Ohio is, you know, we are, we are an aging state. Um, I think people have, have accepted that. Um, it is, it is not reflective of what the 18th house district is. And so um, I have everything from Ohio University uh, through downtown and through uh, the, the southern part of Columbus City. I have German Village and Marion Village. 
And then I have a couple of the first ring suburbs, Grandview, Bexley. Um, I have Old Town East, I have Franklin. So I have uh, a, a large number of craft breweries. I have a large number of colleges, you know, not just Ohio State, but I have Capital, I have Franklin, I have, um, you know, so I have just a large uh, restaurant, bar scene, art museum, COSI, all of the uh, wonderful theater and art that you can imagine and festivals. I just am just really, really fortunate to represent a district that has so much activity, you know, a thriving economy. I just, it's a really cool, really cool place to be able to represent. Well, and that, that brings me to a, and kind of my next question. With, with that district, it's so diverse racially, religiously. Um, and then as you were mentioning with the restaurants and the, and the brew pubs, all that. So, you know, you have COVID, obviously, impacting all those places. You have right. what happened on the racial front, uh, you know, this summer. Uh, now we're, you know, seeing you and I are both, uh, I'm working from home today because of the possible, you know, issues, security threats at the, at the state house. Um, right. You know, something that you're obviously dealing with a lot. How does, how does, you know, the impact on your, your district, what has been the impact, whether it has been that, that racial uh, tension that has happened or from the COVID or what we're seeing right now? Oh, I mean, I think there's just, there's a lot to unpack with that question. Yes. Because it's a, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 certainly the, the civil unrest that we saw this summer, um, I think was very different for the people in my district than it was people that were outside of Ohio uh, or outside of Franklin County. Um, you know, what I saw representing, you know, being the representative and, and, and living in the short north, which um, certainly most of the activity was, was squarely centered around the state capitol, but there were a lot of events going on at parks and, and in the short north as well. Um, you know, I saw a community that, that really understood the difference between someone who was um, trying to speak out for civil rights and for justice and the difference between people that were there to uh, destroy property and vandalize businesses. And the businesses in my community very much understood the difference between those two groups of people and recognized that you could support what the mission of the protesters were that were speaking out for equality and justice and distinguish them from the people that were there to destroy property and wreak havoc. And so what I saw in the community was really a bridge of um, support that came together. I mean, a lot of the businesses that, that had to be sheltered up because of the activity surrounding the protests, you know, came out with artists to paint signs and messages of support for the protesters and to share that they, you know, wanted to stand with them in, in the mission that they were seeking for equality and for justice. And so, you know, that is a very different sense and feel than I think a lot of people outside of Franklin County understood because all they could see outside Franklin County was the destruction that was happening. And that wasn't what I saw. You know, I took a day shortly after one of the incidences where the majority of vandalism occurred to the businesses along High Street in the short north. And I took a day and I put on my mask and I just took a walk and I talked to everyone that was out on the street, you know, sweeping up the glass and, you know, you know, trying to put boards back up. And, you know, over and over again, um, I heard from that community, like, we stand with them. We, this has always been a community that embraced equality and inclusivity, and we don't want what happened today to change, um, you know, who we are and what our values are. 
And so we, we can, we can sweep up this glass, but we're not going to let it change who we are. And that was really powerful. And it was really, I think, amazing to watch those um, community leaders and those business owners and the actors activists, you know, really take a stand together that, you know, bad things can happen and we can stay on message and still support each other. I think it's a fascinating look at what you're dealing with, with other legislators who are coming from all throughout the state. Just in my very small example, you know, I'm out east 40 minutes or so, and I had a number of people say to me, oh, you're going downtown, isn't it scary? Right. You know, it, it was never right. it was never scary, but I think in a lot of people's minds who weren't around or didn't see it on a daily basis, it was like, oh, you, you know, it's a war zone down there. So right. I can right. only imagine you dealing with legislators who are, you know, two and a half hours, you know, northwest corner of Ohio, very different perspective. It was, I mean, it was very frustrating to see members of the legislature come down to the Capitol and put stuff on their social media about, you know, how angry they were that this happened to their capital and how, you know, angry, and certainly they have the right to do that, but it was just, it was really a distorted sense of, or distorted sense isn't the right word. Maybe it, they, they didn't share the full picture Mm -hmm. in that one tweet or that one posts that they put on social media about the destruction and about how, you know, awful it was to see the state house, um, you know, be vandalized. It didn't reflect what was happening as a whole in the community. And that was, I think, it really fed this narrative that you, you know, mentioned was that people were, um, you know, thinking of this as just destruction and uh, something that was, all um, all rooted in the vandalism and the bad parts of yep. what was happening. And, you know, even as recently as this week when we've been preparing for the protests that um, were expected to happen as the transition of power in the presidency occurred, you know, I, having conversations with law enforcement about the relationships that they've been able to develop now with different uh, activists in the community are really genuine relationships where there's information sharing and dialogue and their ability to prepare for what could have happened this weekend because they now know so many of the leaders in the community, I think really created an advantage for them in trying to address, you know, this other scary situation mm-hmm. that we were sort of waiting for. Well, I was going to ask you, did you ever think you'd see the state house surrounded by Humvees and that much fencing and that many? <laughs> I, I have never seen anything like it. When I, when I took, when I um, sought this position in 2016, I never honestly thought that I would Google how to buy a Kevlar vest <laughs> and, and have a conversation. Wow with State Highway Patrol in a very serious way of, do I need to tell my members that they should consider purchasing a Kevlar vest? And have that be like, like not, not joking, like to be very, to be very serious. It was a recommendation that the governor of Michigan and the attorney general of Michigan both issued to their legislative members. And, um, you know, you have to ask the question, okay, if, if does Ohio need to be on this path as well? Like, do we need to take this kind of protection for ourselves? And, and I would have never thought I needed to have that conversation in 2016. Well, and hopefully, hopefully you won't have to have it anymore. Um, right. And, and let's talk about what you should be talking about. And, you know, we just started a new, a new general assembly and wanted to get your kind of feelings on, your priorities and then as i mentioned you know you've been elected by your your peers as assistant minority leader so your caucus priorities maybe they're the same exact or you know uh kind of what do you hope to work on uh, this year and what do, you, what do you think your caucus will be? right well i mean i think and this isn't going to come to a surprise as any to anyone recovering from COVID is going to be absolutely the most important uh work that we do 
in terms of um, how you see the budget being shaped. Um, we are, we need to get people back to work. We need to get kids, you know, in school safely. That's the safely, the most important uh, keyword there. Everybody wants to see kids back in school. And, you know, we're going to have a major issue with our daycares. You know, we have 40% of our daycares believe that they're going to be closed by March which means we're going to have 100,000 Ohio families without childcare. And so, you know, we are in a dire situation. And I think that historically we hear people talk about the budget as an opportunity to create jobs and uh, implement workforce training opportunities. The problem is if people don't have somewhere to take their kids, that they can rely on and have uh, a safe place for their children. It doesn't matter how many jobs we create if parents can't get there. Yeah. <laughs> and true. I think that we've seen um, this particular economic recession has been very different than the last eight recessions we've seen in the last 50 years in terms of this is, this is the first economic recession in, in over 50 years where more women have lost jobs than men. And when you look at um, the December job loss, every single job loss was a woman. 120,000 jobs that were lost in December were lost by women. And obviously there were men who lost their jobs in December, but you had 16,000 men return to the workforce that, that leveled wow. out the offset. So when you look at, you know, and, and that is very much tied into to child care issues and, and school issues. And so, you know, we have done for a long time way too little to support people who take care of the people we love, whether that's our children, whether that's our aging parents. The people who care for the people we love have sort of been missed in this economy that we've created. And if we don't start giving them the support they need to continue taking care of people we love, um, we aren't going to be able to function. Um, we aren't going to be able to be a part of this workforce. And that doesn't, doesn't matter how many jobs create, how many workforce training opportunities that are available. You can't leave the house, you can't leave the house. So <laughs> that is, that's the lens that I think you're going to see a lot of my caucus members looking at um, COVID relief through is, you know, who are the people who historically haven't had a voice at the table who are being the most impacted in a negative way from this economic downturn and trying to give them the relief and what they need to recover um, so that we can have a healthy economy. And what's really interesting, and I won't belabor this anymore, but when we talk about the record number of women leaving the workforce, um, what we know is since 1970, so for the last 50 years, the only expansion we've seen to the middle class is directly correlated to women's economic gains. And so when we talk about this being devastating for women's economic security, it really is going to blow a hole in the entire middle class. Well, I think you outlined a great picture, just how connected all of this is. You can't, you can't solve one problem if you're not dealing with this problem over right. here. You know? um, and, and so how, you know, in the minority, right, I think you're on your third speaker since you've been here that you're dealing with your island majority. Like maybe, maybe fourth or fifth. If you're here. <laughs> um, true. How, how do you, how do you operate in that, in that setting? You know, what, what do you advice are you giving to your members about, you know, obviously the, we, but we've seen it, we've seen it in committee where amendments get tabled or, you know, maybe ideas aren't taken up because of the minority. What, what advice, especially to new ones coming in, you know, what's the best way to get some of those policy goals through, even though they might not have, you know, the uh, Democrat as a lead sponsor? Right. I mean, that's a good question, and it has changed with every speaker. Um, and, you know, I think we are 
very much trying to figure out the path with the new speaker that currently um, is is holding the gavel. And uh, I, I, I don't know what is going to be um, motivating for him at this point. I think that the the tensions, I mean, you know, we see it at the national level are pretty high between uh, parties. I, I think the tensions uh, at the state between parties are, are, are higher than I've ever seen them before. And, you know, I, I don't know what's going to break through that. Um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to start building back uh, after COVID, some of those fractured relationships, but it's really hard now when you can't even talk to each other because you have members that won't wear masks and you're afraid that you're exposing yourself to um, getting sick from a virus that, you know, even if you're not personally afraid that you'll have the worst health outcomes from, you know, me getting the virus means that my kids get kicked out of daycare for three right. weeks. <laughs> so like, I can't, it's not like the flu. Like <laughs> if, if I get sick, they get stuck home with yeah. me. And that, you know, upends my life. So <laughs> I love them. <laughs> I do. But it's just, you know, navigating these different challenges with COVID and feeling like you can't, you can't talk to each other and you can't be together uh, is, is really difficult in terms of building the relationships that you need to help, you know, work together. And mm -hmm. that's just where we're at right now. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting from the lobbying side of things, that right. uh, lack of interaction. And, you know, usually we're at the state house or meeting in, in your offices. Um, right. And that, that stuff can't happen. So, you yeah, know, it's uh, something we've had to and, adapt to for sure. Um, and we we all miss it terribly. Like I I am an uber extrovert. <laughs> I miss people. Like, you can't tell at all. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, until you know, and, and until we can be together safely, you know, and and work together safely as a body. I mean, the fears that my members have about contracting COVID are, are real. I mean, we had two members hospitalized because of an outbreak in finance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they they put themselves at risk because it was lame duck and they were termed out and they had very specific legislative agendas that they wanted to accomplish. And they were willing to, to risk getting sick in order to do the work they needed to get that done. And they were hospitalized over Christmas because of it. And that's heartbreaking. Yeah. So just a couple more questions. Uh, one, so what's, what's harder, being a mom to young kids or trying to get caucus people in line? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> I you, think, you don't have to answer. Well, you know, I, that one you could just take a pass on. I should I preface wonder. that I, um, in order to, we, we decided we were going to get out of town this weekend because of all of the um, activity that was planned around the state house. Um, didn't want to be near it. So we got a hotel up in Cleveland, which is the first time we've stayed the night as a family of four together in a hotel for over a year, year and a half. And we realized my son, who's now two, doesn't believe in sleeping in hotel rooms. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I might have a different answer to that question today than I would have five days. Oh, that's rough. That is rough. <laughs> well, okay. Now, a more serious one. Obviously, we're going to put this out there, and you know, our clients who are watching it, and as you mentioned, budget, you know, pick up all the oxygen for the next month. What's the best way for clients, for constituents, to get involved in the? budget process you know is it a huge policy besides just the the numbers things it seems to be the main policy driver anymore suggestions on folks getting involved in, in the budget process right um well they have to communicate i mean that's step one is you know working with either um their lobbying arm or if they have an association um, you know, raising it to their um, association or to their lobbyists to make sure that legislators know 
what their uh, what requests they're seeking, calling their members directly. I mean, it's it is a it's a full frontal war that you have to sort of develop, and it's you know engaging the lobbying community, engaging their association, and then engaging having members of their association engage directly with their elected representatives is really what you have to do. Because obviously, and, and Josh, I know you appreciate this, we have a great relationship. You call me, you can explain something to me, and I can understand where you're coming from. But nothing is as motivating as hearing directly from an impacted constituent about why they're seeking the legislative policy that they're seeking. You know, I love hearing from my constituents. I want to know what I can do, uh, you know, through my position as a state representative to make their work better, make their life better, make their community better. And so those direct conversations with constituents mean the world to me and they go a long way. Um, but they don't necessarily always are able to take you past the finish line because you need 99 of us well, you need 51 of us at least to be on board with the, you know, suggested legislative policy that you're advocating for. And so that's where using an association that um, is similarly aligned with your values is helpful. And having a lobbying team is helpful. I mean, it's, it is, it's, a, it's never a this or that, it's a and this and that and more mm -hmm. answer. Yeah. Well, and then and the final thing I want to ask you about is, you know, the the minority leadership, um, very diverse. I think top three spots are all women. You've been a, yeah. a champion of, of, of women and inclusion, and it's something that Calfee believes in deeply. And so just kind of want to get your thoughts on, you know, it seems that more women are entering politics. Um to you know to a degree and just kind of your thought on those women who may have made that inkling or you know doing a lot of complaining like you were saying and why you know <laughs> that drive I, what gets them to take that next step what you know what, what would be your advice on saying yeah go for it you, can do this. you know it's funny i think um women tend to run for office when they feel like their elected officials aren't listening to them or the government is failing them. Um, I talk to a lot of men who have a passion for government and have a passion for politics. And this is like, this is their first uh, choice and a career path. And women seem to get involved in politics when all other avenues have failed. <laughs> and so, but I think that makes them incredibly strong advocates mm -hmm. and incredibly strong members once they get here. And so um, I certainly for any woman who is thinking about running for office, um, knowing the why, like why you want to run, what is motivating you to run um, is I think a huge piece of that puzzle in terms of, you know, building out a, a platform to do that. And I think women do that really well because they they, they always, um, whenever a woman asks me to go to coffee and because she wants to talk about running for office, she can tell me why she wants to run. And that is <laughs> huge. Um, so I think for, for women, it then becomes more of the hurdle of believing that they have the right skill set and that they have the right qualifications and that they have the support to be able to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is only going to happen when you continue to have more and more conversations with folks that can um, assure you that yes, you are qualified. Yes, you have the right credentials. Yes, you will have the support you need if you stick your neck out. And you know, so with that in mind, I, my best advice is encouraging women to just talk to as many people as you can, that you trust their opinion, you trust that they have uh, the ability to guide you for what your best interests are. And then when you're ready, give me a call. And I'm always happy <laughs> to talk to any woman who wants to, is thinking about running for office. 
Terrific. Well, as usual, wonderful advice and uh, really appreciate your time and being able to work with you and look forward to when we can actually do this face to face at some point, uh, Hope, hopefully yes. soon again. Um, Hopefully soon. I agree. I agree. I miss seeing uh, everyone buzzing around the state house, and I miss that activity and that energy. And you know, I never thought I'd miss lobbyists so much, Josh. <laughs> and us with legislators. So, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and, and really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Bye.